Aloha, namaskar, and hello. Welcome to Climate Change Beyond Outrage, where we go beyond outrage to focus on solutions to climate problems facing people, nations, and the world. I'm your host, Anu Hittel, broadcasting live from ThinkTech Studios in beautiful downtown Honolulu. There are many ways for you to get talking with us. You can join our conversation by tweeting us at ThinkTechHI, and now you can call us at 415 871-2474. Once we're done with the show, don't feel bereft. Join our conversation on our Facebook page of the same name, Climate Change Beyond Outrage. In today's episode, we focus on oceans, oceans that make up three quarters of the Earth's surface. Oceans face many threats, most of which are human-induced. To help me tell the story of the challenges oceans face and the efforts to help rescue them, I have with me Pierre-Yves Cousteau, who runs Cousteau Divers. According to their website, by uniting a community of divers who are concerned about the marine environment, Cousteau Divers brings the legacy of Jacques-Yves Cousteau to life, making each diver an agent of the study and conservation of the aquatic realm. Pierre-Yves is also a goodwill ambassador to the IUCN, which is the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, which just had its large 10-day congress here. Pierre-Yves, welcome. Thank you. Aloha. Aloha. It's nice to have you in Hawaii and nice to have you on the show. Thanks. It's great to be here. And so you came here for the IUCN Congress, for the World Conservation Congress. But before we get into that, would you tell us a little bit about uh, the challenges that oceans face and what is Cousteau Divers doing to help yeah, with that? Sure, absolutely. Um, so there is no single threat right now on the oceans. It's a combination of things that we're doing to the oceans that are really starting to jeopardize its well-being. It's, um, I'd say the three major threats are climate change, um, pollutions, which include plastic pollutions, and uh, overfishing. So by changing the chemistry of the water and by taking out most of its fish through overfishing, basically we're eroding the resilience of the ecosystems making them a lot more fragile and a lot more um, susceptible to die um, in case of brutal events. And um, yeah, th there's, um, you know, these three things, climate change, pollutions, overfishing, they're actually, when you look at them, they're just symptoms of a greater problem. They are what, you know, business as usual calls externalities. And addressing, you know, the root causes, which is our current socioeconomic model that we live in, um, I think is the way we should be going. Rather than trying to put band-aids on all these symptoms, um, we should really start to think, rethink our societies, rethink the way we live with nature and with each other um, in order to stop having these negative externalities that are devastating the planet. And, you know, sorry to keep going about this, but um, the oceans feed about a billion people on this planet. They produce half the oxygen you're breathing right now. And uh, they, they buffer climate change. They hold 90% of the excess heat that we, that we release into the atmosphere. So they provide services that, are not, that, are, that go beyond just enjoying nature and enjoying life and enjoying mammals and, you know, and dolphins and sharks. And it's, they're providing benefits that keep us alive, literally. And of course, you <coughs> have seen this firsthand because you've been diving from a very young age. Yes. And you've been, you, you come from a family of divers. That's uh, right. Any relation to Jacques Cousteau? Uh, yes, actually, there's a, there's a big one, uh, big. other than the nose. Yeah. Uh, there's, also a, there's also the fact he was my father. Um, yes, yes. So, uh, and so you've all, obviously you have the ocean in your blood, so to speak. We all do, actually. Our, our blood uh, chemistry is very, very similar. We all do, yes. and you more so than some of us <coughs> land lovers. But, um, you know, so how did you get started with Cousteau Divers? And tell us what, you know, what is Cousteau Divers doing to help with some of these, um, to help... Yeah solve some of these problems? So six years ago, I um, launched Cousteau Divers. I was working as a diving instructor in Greece, and I realized that I, I didn't want to be just a passive observer of the degradation of destruction of marine life. So I decided to start my NGO, Cousteau Divers, leveraging the power of the Cousteau brand and name in order to empower people who care, to give them the tools to help them study and protect marine life. So it's a citizen science organization. What that means is that we ask people who are passionate about nature but are not necessarily scientists to report some observations that can then be useful for the better understanding of the oceans. And so these are divers that are reporting back on some of the things they're seeing? Yep, divers and free divers. Um, so What's the difference? Uh, so free divers don't use tanks, they don't use scuba equipment, they, they just go in a breath hold. 
Um, and they well, actually they go very deep. They go very <laughs> very deep, deep. Yeah. They um, do. I was just recently on an expedition to the Galapagos <laughs> with a uh, French freediving champion, Guillaume Neri, who reaches 400 feet in breath hold, which is just blows my mind. I'm, I'm just starting in that. How long do you have to hold your breath to do that? <laughs> I don't know how long his, uh, his descent was. Probably around two minutes, something like that. Oh. Two or three minutes. Oh my gosh. But, okay. yeah. but it's also very interesting um, that, uh, just to go back to the Cousteau divers, just to explain a little bit what we're doing, is taking people that are passionate about the ocean, be they freedivers or scuba divers, and asking them to report observations. And what I launched last year is Project Hermes. It has nothing to do with the luxury brand. <laughs> it's, uh, <laughs> it's the messenger god in the Greek uh, mythology. Right. And the idea is that all these scuba divers and freedivers, for the past 10 years, have been recording the temperature of the ocean using their dive computers. And today, we don't have that data. Nobody knows the temperature of the ocean in real time, in shallow waters, in coastal areas, where most of marine life is. So the idea is to centralize all these, these, this data, people sending us their, their dive computer data so that we can hack the ocean, we can reveal the temperature of the ocean in real time worldwide, which is necessary to understand how the ocean works, how it stores and releases energy. So is the dive computer, I know nothing about diving because I feel terrified of diving. I do oh, no. snorkel and I swim, but I don't like to go way deep down under and let alone have to hold my breath. But, okay. I can um, fix that if you want. We can, <laughs> you can go out together. In. Right, there's a reef out here. We, yeah. can, we can do something. We don't there. have to go very far. <laughs> right. Um, but <clears throat> do divers go out with computers then? Yes, every diver must dive with a dive computer. And the computer is usually telling them what? The, the main function of the dive computer is to tell you how long you can stay at a given depth without going into what they call decompression. So how much you're saturating your tissues with uh, nitrogen during your dive. So the computer will say, oh, you only have three minutes left at this depth. You have to go up. So that, so that information in addition to that information, there's other information that computer is collecting. Exactly. Okay. Temperature is being recorded by these computers, although it's not one of the main functions of the computer. They are, and they have been recording temperature for the past 10 years. Ah, and so that's what you're now trying to... Centralize that data, yeah, absolutely. And so I noticed on your website, and we have a couple of screenshots of your website, if maybe we can put that up on the screen, that there are people who are sending in both images. I don't know. Well, you explain. Explain yeah, what's going on sure. here. Um, so basically, uh, the, dive, uh, the, the, the website, Custo Divers, uh, records photos and videos. So if you're a diver, you just upload your photos and videos and these dive temperatures uh, from the, the new project I launched. So basically, the idea behind the photos is that anyone can send their photos of underwater stuff. Are there particular parameters for the photos? or it's Right now, no, because okay. we're trying to get as many people as possible to do it. Mm -hmm. So they upload pictures, and they just have to say where and when. Right. That's what I noticed. I clicked on Africa, and then it said there are these many images from that region. And then it showed me all the, and then when I clicked on, it said, this is where, and this is when it was That's taken. That's right, so that we can hopefully in the future go through these images with algorithms or, or people, <laughs> and through citizen science, um, basically identify which species were present when and where. So these, t this tells you where people have registered and sort of recent activity. Recent activity, yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's all over the world. Yeah, uh, the great thing about the Cousteau legacy and the Cousteau brand is that it resonates with a lot of people worldwide, and there's a great opportunity to use that for, for good, to use that um, to get people involved in conservation and citizen science and to get them really um, to do something about, about how, the Well, how did this idea come to you? I, honestly, I, I don't know. I was diving in, uh, in Greece, <laughs> and I just realized I have a powerful name, but the most powerful way to use it is to empower others. And you just thought this would be a good... Because there are other citizen science projects. I know of one on land, but I've never heard of one in the ocean, and this is perfect because it's very similar to what they're doing on land. They're looking at... Um, it's called Project Bud Burst, and they look at when things flower, fruit, mm -hmm. and so on. You know, it's just the phenology, what yep. bio geeks would call phenology. So, so there is that, and they, they send that into a centralized database, and then you can make sort of climate predictions and look at Absolutely. it's basically that collection yeah. of data. And it's, again, citizen science. You can do it once. You can keep going back to that spot. Is that similar for your? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Uh, citizen sciences have been well developed on land. A little bit less so underwater, but they're starting to, to do so. There are some more advanced programs um, that require that you lay out transects, that you count fish and things like that. We're staying away from that just because it's more of a niche and speci specialized thing. Uh, and we're trying to appeal to anyone who gets in the water. So really dumbing down the science to increase the amount of data we get. Um, so Keeping it simple, but at the same time very extensive so yes. that people can join in. Absolutely. Yeah. 
So that's how you got started. And um, Custo Divers has been going on for six years now. What do you do with this data? Uh, so the idea behind this data is to be able to basically feed it into the World Ocean Database um, so that the temperature data becomes available. Uh, there's a lot of potential applications for Who the data. Who runs the World Ocean Database? Um, is it? Uh, say it's NOAA. It's NOAA. So you yeah. were you were an intern with NOAA. Uh, with NASA. Sorry. Oh, NASA. Yeah, this okay. is another lifetime when I was right. studying okay. astrobiology. Oh, right. And, okay. Uh, okay. In, with yeah. NASA and European Space yeah. Agency. Okay. Um, but my, my my activities have changed quite a bit, and Crystal Divers now is most of my my activities, including my work with IUCN as a consultant. Um, but uh, what I'm doing now is I'm on a on a six month global journey to go back to all the places my father visited and to see what changed, mm. to witness the difference between when he was there and when I'm going now and understand why. Why did we, why did things get better or why did they get worse and to try to understand. So is Hawaii one of those places? So my father uh, was did not make a, a film about uh, Hawaii. Oh, he didn't. So oh my gosh. He did a lot of so films. So you're going to correct that. I'm right? going to correct that, absolutely. <laughs> I, I'm making it right now as you speak. Will, That's right. I'll start releasing these mid-October on social media. So um, if you guys want to follow me, um, you know, on, and tweet. We'll and tweet, tweet about that as yeah. well, yeah. That'd so we'll, we'll take our cues from you whenever you're ready to tweet. We'll yes. retweet those. And I'll just keep talking. Yeah, <laughs> so, <laughs> so do you actually, so are you making movies about your, your travels with the yes. view towards sort of seeing how they are different from what your father saw? Yes, absolutely. And uh, the idea is also to help uh, raise awareness to the importance and the beauty of the ocean so that people start caring and protecting. Uh, the oceans. One of the stops on my journey so far has been to Greenland. Greenland is a lot of ice, as you know. It's like uh, a and mile all thick. The time. A mile thick of ice. Yeah. It's really, really thick. And there's a research station right there. And I spent some time with researchers there, and they're looking at the ice cores and looking at the bubbles mm -hmm. of air, of old um, his um, air that's in the ice. Sorry. And what they're saying, these researchers, they're at the forefront of climate research. They're saying, well, we've already baked into the ocean a 30 feet sea level rise. That's coming our way right now. And we don't know how long it's going to take. Is it going to be 20 years, 50 years, 100 years? Um, but we've already baked it in there because the last time through geologic, uh, geological eras that there was 400 ppms of CO2 in the atmosphere, that's how high the sea level was consistently. Wow. So yeah. it's already there. We've already baked that into the ocean. People have a hard time understanding the inertia that goes with the liquid element rather mm -hmm. than the, um, the air element. So let me illustrate this. If you take a lighter and you put your hand over it, it burns, right? Mm -hmm. If you take the lighter out, it stops burning because mm -hmm. the inertia is very low. If you boil water, you put your finger in it, it hurts. If you take it off the boiler and you put your finger in it, it still hurts for mm -hmm. a long time. Mm -hmm. There is a thermal inertia in right. water right. and we've baked into the ocean already a lot of sea level rise and um, a lot of things. So. You know, we need to do something about climate change really soon because the consequences, we've already worked them into the system. And we're going to talk more about that and your role with the IUCN when we come back from the break. So don't go away. Be sure to tweet us and ask questions or call us. So we'll see you in just a minute. Hey, how you doing? Uh, welcome to Abachi Talk. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm your co-host. And we have a nice program here every Friday at 1 o'clock uh, on Think Tech Studios where we talk about technology and we have a little bit of fun with it. So join us if you can. Thanks. Aloha. Hi, I'm Stacy Hayashi with the Think Tech Hawaii show, Stacy to the Rescue, highlighting some of Hawaii's issues. You can catch it at Think Tech Hawaii on Mondays at 11 a.m. Aloha. See you then. Aloha, I'm Kirsten Baumgart-Turner, host of Sustainable Hawaii. Thanks for watching Think Tech this summer. We have a lot of terrific shows of great importance, and I hope you'll watch my show too every Tuesday at noon as we address sustainability issues for Hawaii. They're really pertinent as the World Conservation Congress approaches in September and the World Youth Congress that's focusing on sustainability next year as well. Have a great summer and tune in at noon every Tuesday. Aloha and welcome back to Climate Change Beyond Outrage. I am here with Pierre-Yves Cousteau and we are talking about climate change and oceans and his work. So 
to go right into it, let's talk a little about your role with the IUCN, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature. You're here in Hawaii because they had their World Conservation Congress. You are one of the goodwill ambassadors um, in, in such company as Jane Goodall, who is also one of those ambassadors, and of course a, a real household name just as your father was. So what, what do you do with, as a goodwill ambassador? And do, I know that one of the things they said is that your breath of fresh air <laughs> to involve some of the young people and to bring the younger generation into conservation issues what would you, how, how would you plan to bring them into conservation issues? How do you plan to reach out to them? And what would you tell young people about these things? Okay, so um, I've actually recently, uh, last year I joined the IUCN as a marine program officer. So I worked for IUCN directly, not just being an ambassador and a figurehead for their work, their conservation work, but also working in the team, the marine team at IUCN, working on issues such as high seas governance, 50% of our planet is beyond national jurisdiction. 50% of this planet belongs to no one and everyone, and it's the Wild West. Um, so this big issue that, that needs to be considered for the future. We work also on plastic um, pollutions, on um, creating uh, innovative finance models for marine conservation uh, to incentivize the financial industry to come in and step into the conservation world and hopefully expand the protected areas. So we need more marine protected areas. Um, and so um, we're also working on seamounts, doing different expeditions. There's really cool stuff that ICN is doing for conservation. And they did come up with a resolution to protect 30% of the world's oceans. And of course, the whole um, announcement for Papahanaumokuakea Marine National Monument to yes. quadruple in size is sort of hopefully a, uh, a way of ratcheting up ambition for other countries as Absolutely. well. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah, and um, no, uh, that's, that's that's absolutely true. And you know, I gave a, TED, a TEDx talk uh, a couple of years ago, and um, basically I was saying in the Mediterranean Sea we have less than five percent that's protected. But if we did the opposite, if we protected all of it and started fishing in only ten or twenty percent of it, we would catch more fish than we're catching now, and we would let the ocean recover. We would never jeopardize it. We would be catching more fish than we're catching now if we inverted things. So instead of thinking 10, 20, 30 percent of ocean protection, why don't we spin it around? 10, 20 percent of fishing areas mm -hmm. protect the rest. Yeah, it'll become so full of life in those 30 percent. And that's something that E. O. Wilson at Harvard University he also says that you know in his book Half Earth he says that we can actually yes. set aside half the Earth. You know, absolutely. And it's, but I like your take, which is. Let's talk about the increase, what people are getting, not what they're giving up. Yes, mm -hmm. absolutely. And um, well, so another highlight for me was uh, speaking in front of the members' assembly, which is a thousand NGOs and a hundred governments, and uh, telling them just what I told you earlier, which is, you know, plastic. We were talking about plastic pollution specifically. It's just a symptom. You know, the oil industry is heavily subsidized. Five hundred billion dollars a year goes into oil and gas as subsidies. For fifty billion dollars goes into overfishing, like your your taxes and my taxes right now serve to increase climate change and to deplete the oceans even more. Is that a message for our young people to know? Well, I think it's a little bit of a. It's definitely something that you know. So that they can put outrageous. pressure. It's mm -hmm. outrageous, and, and I, I think we, we need yeah. to step up to our government and say we don't want to keep subsidizing things that are destroying our planet. Let's stop subsidizing those things. Um, but I, you know, for for younger generations, I, what I say is. Do what you love, do it really well, and then use that to make the world a better place. You don't have to be a marine ecologist, you don't have to be a politician or something. You whatever can work it is, for the oil industry. Whatever, whatever it is you're working right. for, if you're doing something you love, yeah. then you have your heart in it and you can, and you can use that to make the world a better place. Mm -hmm. so, so we need that greening everywhere, not just We need a cultural in shift inside mm -hmm. our, our societies, yes. We need to love and to care for nature, to realize our indiscernible bond with nature. We are nature. We're not, there's not nature here and us here. It's, we're just part of it. And, and we need to change the way we conceive living together, I think, with nature and make peace with nature. Now, speaking of nature, there is this wonderful place on this earth called the Galapagos. Yes. And you've been there recently, and you've been working there. Absolutely. So um, I was there recently shooting a documentary called The Galapagos Evolution that should come out in the coming weeks. Or months, 
and uh, it was about free diving in the Galapagos. We, we set aside the equipment, the diving equipment, and we went in on a breath hold, and that allowed us to get so much closer to the animals. I was inside the schools of hammerhead sharks. I was one of them. And just, it just blurs those lines between uh, you and nature, you know, and it's one of Could those... Could you hear them? Well, sharks don't make noises that we can hear. Uh-huh. Um, but w I, I did hear a humpback whale singing and dolphins clicking and whistling. Amazing. Uh, yeah. So it's, yeah. it's really profoundly changing experience. And I, I strongly encourage, by the way, people and, and younger generations, I think the first step is to go out into the sea. Go and swim. Go and dive. Put on a mask. Go experience it. I have great friends here in Halewa who are taking people out uh, to swim with sharks. Mm -hmm. uh, one ocean diving and it's great because you know they're trying to reconcile man and sharks which sharks are traditionally are kind of our enemies you know and and they're really doing not a traditionally job. I would say recently well I, right? I disagree with that view that jaws changed the world I don't think that's true yeah. I mean, I, mean I, I know that in the Hawaiian tradition they've revered sharks for a long time that, that's extremely interesting and I'm glad you mentioned that because I think traditional knowledge mm -hmm. not just in Hawaii but everywhere in the world has a huge role to play in reconciling men and nature and in teaching us new ways of, of living together. So I think really traditional societies here and elsewhere uh, will increasingly have an important role to play in conservation of nature. I know that at the IUCN Congress, they uh, now they've um, included indigenous peoples as a category of membership as well, so you don't have to be a state or an NGO. or So that's I think that's yeah. a step in the right direction. Oh, absolutely. And um, most of the, the last remaining pristine places on this planet are under their custody right. so you know right. they we, we need to 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 they need to teach us how to a lot of things about their culture that we need to adapt I think into our um, consumerist culture so that we become more in tune with nature and more in tune with living together what would you say to young people who are not interested in becoming less consumerist mm -hmm. even if you know so you say that um, they should do what they love. Well, what if they love going shopping and well, they love to buy things and... I would and say, I would say, be conscious of the conditioning you have. Realize that your mind is influenced all the time. Right now it's being influenced by me and, and you. Um, but every time you see a billboard, every time you see an advertising, just see how they, they seep into your mind and create desires that are not necessarily yours. And when you realize that all that psychological ecosystem you have, your own ecosystem, your nature, your inner nature, is influenced by what you see and what you choose in your life, then you can start making it the way you want it to be, not just be a victim of advertising and media and television and politics. So it's about just take, being conscious of that conditioning and trading goods for experiences. Go out, you know, instead of spending money doing, uh, buying uh, an object that'll be obsolete in a year's time, go out and, and travel and dive and see nature and see the world and meet people because those are the things that ultimately will stay with you not the things you buy at the, at the so moment. So th that's, that's very interesting because, um, of course, to do all of these things and to be conscious and so on, you need to be awake and not apathetic. And um, it's been said that this generation, even though it is service-minded, the millennials and so on, even though that they're service-minded, they are still apathetic to their surroundings and to their environment, maybe because they feel that there is no solution to this huge mm -hmm. problem. Absolutely. I think we're hammered all the time with fear and uh, you know, horrible things that are going on on the news and things like that. So when you see that these problems are global, they're huge, they're all over, and you, you get this helplessness, and you're like, well, there's nothing I can do about it. You know? So then I think you just shut off your empathy, um, which is dangerous. And I think one way of reconnecting is um, basically finding something that has an impact. Empowerment. Doing something and watching its consequences. So, you know, whatever it is, if there's one thing you can do in your household. If you can tell, you know, your parents to stop using disposable plastic. Um, if Water you, bottles. Well, yeah, if you can just cut down a little bit on your meat consumption. You know, those are little things you do in your everyday life that have a lot of impact, refusing single-use plastic, cutting down on meat consumption, um, being vocal, you're not alone. Like, I think a lot of people care about nature, but they don't have a place to talk about it, and they feel almost like you're ostracized from society because you care about nature, which is weird, right? Uh, that's how materialistic we've gotten. But you're not alone. Like, there are thousands of people who really care about nature and who are doing amazing things right now, young people with NGOs, dynamic um, projects, you know, 
bringing people together. Movements are, are, are starting. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things going on and a lot of things to be part of that will have an impact, that do have an impact. People don't realize that we are constantly broadcasting values. And you can choose which values you broadcast. And you, by, by, by doing that, you influence the people around you. And you change the world every single day with every word that comes out of your mouth. You are changing the world. So I think you're right. You need to be awake. You need to, to be conscious of that. Um, but uh, thanks to you and thanks to shows like this, you know, we can get these kind of messages out. So. Well, um, tell us before we leave, we just have um, a minute or so left, but before we leave, what was it like the first, do you remember the first time you went into the ocean? Yeah. And dived? Absolutely. Or is it dove? I used to be afraid of water. I used oh, to be really? afraid of water. I was, I was terrorized of water when I was a kid. And one day I was at the pool um, on, you know, with the rest of my class and everyone was jumping in the water in a neat little line and I didn't want to go. I was afraid, I was terrorized and I just said, you know what, I'm just going to do it. I'm just going to overcome that fear, I'm going to jump in the water, I'm going to swim. And I did. And I was never afraid again. So I was nine years old when I dove for the first time with my father. And um, it's just, I'm just in love with the ocean and every chance I have to reconnect with it um, and to protect it and to do, hopefully raise awareness about the importance and the plight of the oceans. Yeah, he must. He would be so proud of you, and Thank he must you. have been so proud of you as you were growing up as well. But Thank you. Sure. I think that knowing, in a way, you know, you are your own pioneer with your citizen science in the marine area, and just as he was a pioneer, so are you. And I feel like it's sort of come full circle. I feel very honored to have you here. Thank and you I very thought, much. I also like this quote by your father, which I've used in my show before, but I think it's an honor and it's very appropriate for me to use it here today. So if you don't mind Please. me saying his words, um, the sea, the great unifier is man's only hope. Now as never before, the old phrase has a literal meaning. We are all in the same boat. <laughs> and I like that one because more than even maybe before he knew well, he probably was working with climate change issues because we've been working with climate change issues for a long time. So, but uh, it must be very gratifying to know that you know these things are the things you can carry on and fight the good fight. You know, I have another quote of his, and it's in substance because I don't have it exactly. But uh, protecting the environment is a way of extending ourselves in every possible way through love, through knowledge, through creation, and through you know just marveling at, at life amazing and complex life is. So um, it's not boring. No, no. <laughs> and never a dull day when you're working right. in conservation. And it gives meaning to your life. It gives uh, purpose. Well, thank you so much for the good work and for being here. Thank you. And we look forward to seeing those videos, those movies. So, um, and we will be back in another special broadcast at some point, but catch us on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook. So aloha, namaskar, and goodbye.